Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Word of God that I'd like to study with you this morning is taken from our first reading. It's the beginning chapter of Job that's printed out in your worship folder. might not be as familiar as people would expect. I found out that in 24 years, this is the first time I've ever preached on the book of Job. But I want to start by asking a couple of questions to get you thinking. Uh, agree or disagree? You want to suffer. Anyone? Volunteers? Probably not, right? <laughs> Most of us, maybe none of us, want to suffer. Although today as we think about suffering, I, I wonder if our study can get you to change your mind a, a little bit. Here's the second one. Agree or disagree, God wants you to suffer. You probably think, well, I'm not supposed to agree with that, but maybe? I'm guessing you've all had periods of suffering, and maybe a repeat suffering or ongoing suffering, to the point that you wondered if you had done something wrong, and God was even punishing you for your sins, and, and maybe you wondered, is this what you want? Does God want you to suffer? We'll think about that, too. As we take a look at the introduction to the book of Job, we pray that the Holy Spirit would help us rethink suffering the way that God thinks about it. The opening chapters of the book of Job introduce us to the person of Job. First, we're told that he lived in the land of Uz. We have no idea really where that is. We know it's east of Israel, so likely in the area of the world that we today would call the, the Middle East. You also likely know that Job was very wealthy. God had blessed him with a wife and with what some might call the perfect family. People used to ask me when I got married, how many kids do you want to have? And I said 10 because I love basketball and I wanted to be able to like practice basketball. But my wife was wiser. She said one at a time. But Job had 10, 10 children, seven boys and three girls. And on top of that, God had blessed him with abundant wealth. Now, they didn't measure wealth with dollars or money, but animals. He had thousands and thousands of donkeys and camels and sheep and goats. He just had herds and herds of animals. In addition to that, the Bible says that Job was one of the most respected men of his area. And he was blameless and upright. Now, that doesn't mean that Job was perfect or sinless, but it does mean that Job repented of his sin and received God's forgiveness, and he did his absolute best with the power of God's Spirit to live according to God's will. It said that he feared God and shunned evil. This is the man, Job. But by the time we get to verse 6, which is where our reading starts, we get an interesting behind-the-scenes look at the spiritual world. First, we're told that the angels presented themselves to the Lord. I have no idea how often this happens or what they were doing there. Maybe the angels appear regularly to give a report to God and, and let him know how they had been carrying out their work as his angels. I, I don't know. But then something kind of shocking happens. Satan appeared with the angels. And he's called Satan by name. It's literally the Satan, like the Lord. This is the name of the most evil angel that has ever existed. He, he's supposed to be kicked out of heaven. So what's he doing there? He had already rebelled. He led other angels to rebel against God. There was this great war between the devil and the evil angels, Michael and the good angels. And Michael and the good angels, they win. And Satan's cast out of heaven, left to roam the earth. So why is he now standing in the presence of the Lord? And that's not even it. The Lord actually addresses him by name. Oh, Satan. It's not quite, how are you doing? But where have you come from? And Satan answers, as you might guess. He said, I've been roaming through the earth, going back and forth in it. Which sounds a lot like the verse from Peter we just heard a few weeks ago. Satan is like a roaring lion seeking to devour you. That's why he's roaming about the earth. He's going back and forth, back and forth, looking for someone to devour. God knows that. 
And then he shockingly says, oh, have you considered my servant Job? Why would God say that? He just essentially invited Satan to attack Job. And God describes Job as I already have. It's God who says there's no one on earth like him. He fears God and shuns evil. So, hey, Satan, have you thought about attacking him? Why would God do that? Satan has a snarky answer. Is it for nothing that Job fears God? In other words, God, do you think that Job fears you just because you're God and he's human and he owes you worship? Or, or is it because... You have stretched out your hand and blessed him so abundantly. Not only that, but you've put this hedge around him so that no one can touch him or his house or any of his possessions. No wonder Job fears you, God. You've blessed him and you protect him. Satan said, how about we try this, Lord? How about you stretch out your hand and strike Job and all he has, and then let's see if he doesn't curse you. To your face. <clears throat> now again, that's probably what you would expect from Satan. But God's answer was, okay. Now God didn't agree that he personally would strike Job, but he said, Satan, everything that Job owns, it's in your hands. If you want to strike it, you go ahead. But God does put limits on Satan. You must not touch the man. And Satan slinks away. He leaves the presence of the Lord. And you probably know what happened next. It's actually still in the first chapter. Job's at home or he's at work. And one of the servants comes and says, Oh, Master, I have really bad news. The Sabaeans attacked. And they took away all of your oxen and all of your donkeys. The the whole herd is gone. And, And while he's still talking, another servant comes in and says, Oh, master, you won't believe it. Fire came down from heaven and, and all your sheep are gone. And, and while he's still talking, another servant comes in. Master, I'm so, I'm so sorry to tell you, but the Chaldeans attack and all of your camels are gone. And while he's still talking, another servant comes in and says, Well, there was this terrible storm and, and all of your children, they were at a house feasting as they usually did. And the house collapsed and they're all gone. This all happened within the matter of, of minutes or an hour. I mean, when Satan decided to stretch out his hand and strike Job, it wasn't just, oh, a little bit here, a little bit there. It was, he just crushed him. Why would God allow such suffering? You know, a lot of people ask that question. And when they ask, they're usually blaming God. How could anyone believe in a God who would allow people to suffer like that? Whatever that is, personal suffering, war, violence, crime, all throughout the world. There's a couple of things we have to set straight. First of all, God is not responsible. He is not the cause of suffering. That takes us right back to Satan, all the way back to the Garden of of Eden. After Satan rebelled and was thrown out of heaven, I'm sure as soon as he was able, he came to the perfect place that God had created, to the perfect people that God had created, and he deceived them into doubting God and thinking that if they took what God forbid, they could have something that they really wanted. And as soon as Adam and Eve doubted God in their hearts and then disobeyed by taking the forbidden fruit... That's when suffering began. And Adam and Eve knew it instantly, without being told even. In their hearts, I mean, they felt guilty. They they felt naked and ashamed and afraid. They tried to hide from God. And, And then God came and very clearly pronounced the consequence of their sin. Now work was going to be hard and men were going to be jerks and women were still going to love the jerks and and everybody was going to get sick and eventually die. Suffering is now just life on earth. And you've all experienced it. But it's not God's fault. Satan tempted Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve sinned, and suffering is the result of sin. 
And there's only one person who has the solution. And that is God. Although God's solution to sin is also something shocking and unexpected. The solution to suffering has to address the cause, which is sin. And the solution to suffering means that someone has to suffer and pay for sin. And it can't be just anyone. It has to be someone who is perfect and righteous in his nature and in his life. And already in the Garden of Eden, God promised to send a Savior who would suffer and pay for sin, who would crush the devil's head. And you know exactly whom God sent. In fact, didn't you think about that last week when we heard about Abraham? When God said, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, the son whom you love, and I want you to sacrifice him. And Abraham takes Isaac to the top of the mountain and lays him on the wood altar, and he lifts the knife, and he is about to sacrifice his own son. When God says, don't do it. Now I know that you love me. And instead there was a ram in the thicket, and God provided a substitute. You realize, especially during Lent, right? That we're the ones who should be suffering. That we're the ones who should be slain because we are the ones who have sinned. But God provided a substitute. And not just anyone. Not just someone. His own son. His only son. The one whom he loved. (coughs) And Jesus came to suffer. He suffered simply by being born. And becoming human. He he suffered in all the regular ways that we do as a little boy. I mean, he had to learn to walk and he fell down and he skinned his knee. And I'm sure that his his brothers and sisters or his cousins or the neighborhood kids, they they probably made fun of him. But it it just got worse as it went on. I I started watching The Chosen again since season four is coming out very soon. I I just started with season three. But it's, it's really the beginning of Jesus suffering. And he keeps telling them, it's not time yet, it's not time yet. But then he goes home to Nazareth and he proclaims that he is fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah, and the people that love him most, they're just disgusted. Who do you think you are? You are going, the carpenter's son, the little boy Jesus, you are going to claim to be the Messiah? How dare you? And they're ready to throw him off of a cliff. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. His his entire nation essentially rejected him. The, The religious leaders, I mean, they were absolutely despised and were disgusted by him. To the point where they paid one of his own 30 silver coins to betray him. And and even though, as we heard last week, Peter said, Jesus, I will never betray you. I will die with you. But all the disciples deserted him and fled. As Jesus stands before the high priest, people spit in his face and slap him. Oh, you think you're a prophet? Tell me, who hit you? And then the Romans? (coughs) And even the the evil Roman oppressors, they're going to crown him with thorns and put a purple robe on him and say, oh, hail, king of the Jews. They're going to whip and beat him within an inch of his life and then force him to carry that heavy wooden cross to the top before they basically strip him naked and nail him to it. And even the thieves on either side are saying, oh, if you're the Lord, why don't you save yourself? And us? I mean, it's, it never ended. Satan reached out his hand and caused Jesus to suffer more than Job ever did. He had the same goal, too. Satan wanted Jesus to curse God, his father, to his face. But it wasn't what Satan did that hurt the most. God refused to strike Job directly. But the father did not refuse to strike his son. Did you think of it when we were speaking Psalm 22? When Jesus is hanging on the cross and... And it's hard enough with the physical and emotional pain and humiliation, but but then he cries out, my God, my God, why have you, Father, forsaken me? And why did he do that? To be your substitute. Jesus suffered in our place so that he could put an end to suffering. Because when the Son of God suffered and died on a cross, He paid for our sin. 
And when he paid for sin, that means that is the end of suffering. Especially for believers. Maybe only for believers. Job believed. You believe. So why do we still suffer? A couple of other reasons. One of the reasons we still suffer is because we still sin. Now, this is going to sound like playing with words, but it really isn't. For the unbeliever, suffering is punishment for sin. But for the believer who has received forgiveness by the suffering and death of Christ, God can no longer punish you for your sins. He's already punished Christ. However, God does use our suffering to discipline us. And I know that that maybe sounds again like playing with words, but suffering or punishment is really just to inflict pain. Discipline teaches And one of the reasons God allows us to suffer is he wants to teach us to turn away from sin. If sin causes suffering and you want to at least lessen your suffering, then stop sinning. Right? You you learn that when you touch a hot stove, right? God put pain receptors in your finger so that if you touch a hot stove, you pull off right away. And if you don't want to get burned, don't touch the hot stove, right? And if you don't want to get pregnant and you don't want to catch an STD... Don't have sex outside of marriage. And if you don't want to get thrown into jail, don't steal. And if you don't want to get pulled over or hurt somebody because you've been drinking and driving, don't drink and then drive. Sometimes we cause our own suffering because we sin and we need the constant reminder that sin always leads to suffering and left unchecked, it will lead to eternal suffering the first thing God wants to teach us. The second thing God wants to teach us is not to put our faith in earthly things. Satan implied that Job only trusted in God because God had blessed him. We're tempted to think that too. It's easy to worship God when your retirement plan looks like it's doing pretty well. It's easy to worship God when you're surrounded by family and friends and people that love you, especially when they blow smoke up your ear and tell you how great you are. And it's easy to love God when you you say it too. Well, at least I have my health. What happens when all those things go away? What happens when the person you love most goes to be with God and leaves you behind? What happens when, in one day maybe, your retirement account drops in half or more? What happens when you don't have your health and you're struggling? Do you still trust God? Ultimately, that's what God wants to teach you. He wants you to learn to trust in Him in every situation and in all circumstances. Even when all of your camels and donkeys and sheep and goats are gone in one day. Even when all ten of your children are killed at the exact same time. Even when Satan comes back and convinces God to, uh, to convict you or to conflict you with all kinds of boils. And you don't have your health. Even when it's just you and it feels like there's nothing to live for and it's only suffering. Even then, God wants you to trust him. How can you do that? Because you know Jesus. Because you know that God the Father already suffered sending his own son. Because you know everything that Jesus suffered in his life and in his death. Because you trust that after Jesus suffered, his suffering came to an end. You know that at the end of Lent, there's an Easter You know that Jesus rose from the dead and descended into heaven and he's promised to come back and take you to be with him. I I mentioned earlier someone was challenging this as a YouTube video. How can you trust in a God that suffers? The gentleman gave a great answer. He said, listen, whether you're a believer or not, you're going to suffer. That's life in this world. We all suffer. Your choice is to suffer forever without God or to suffer for a little while with God and know that it will come to an end. And doesn't God give you that hope? We heard that in Romans 5. 
We glory in our suffering because suffering produces perseverance and perseverance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his Holy Spirit into our lives. I don't know what you're suffering, but I know that you are. I know that some, you have trouble walking, you have trouble breathing. Some of you or people you, you love, they have chronic conditions that have been going on for years or there's cancer that just won't seem to go away. You feel lonely. You're not sure how you're going to pay the bills because your furnace breaks down in the middle of the, the winter or your car breaks down. And of course, you need that every single day. And it's this thing and it's that thing. And it's, it's always one thing after another. But don't forget that God is with you. And God promises that whatever you're going through, he's going to give you the strength to endure it. And he promises that one day it will all come to an end. So let's go back to the beginning. Does God want you to suffer? You can do both. God doesn't want you to suffer just to inflict pain. <laughs> but sometimes, yes, God will allow or even send suffering to draw you closer to himself. Do you want to suffer? Probably not. But did I change your mind enough so that you're willing to suffer? Because you know that when you do, you can trust God. And just as we'll come to the end of the season of Lent and we'll see Jesus in all of his glory, you can trust that one day too, you will see God in all of his glory and your suffering will end. Amen. Amen.